do you have uh, a, a certain recipe or dish? Do you have something that you like, man, I do not want to mess this up? Gumbo, for sure. Oxtails, curried goat, shrimp etouffee. Like a lot of these dishes are like, I can't Hard. mess it up at all. Yeah. Like just just actual just rice, just plain rice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have a recipe in there just for perfectly steamed rice, you know? So like most of these dishes, if I mess up, like I'm going to get my black card revoked. <laughs> Hey all, what's going on? You're listening to Chicago Humanities Tapes, the audio arm of Chicago's long-running festival creating experiences through culture, creativity, and connection. I'm Elisa Rosenthal, and I'm here to bring you the best of the best of the live festival from the past 30 years and counting. Today, we're going to hear from James Beard award-winning chef Kwame Anwachi, who you might also know from Top Chef, on drawing inspiration from his Nigerian heritage and trusting your own voice in cooking, and the coolest person he's ever gotten to cook for. Stick around for that one because the answer is pretty dope. He brings his New York Bronx vibes to chat with Chicago's own Dario Durham and Sarah Fada from the podcast 77 Flavors of Chicago, a podcast where they discuss the heritage and track down the food of all 77 of Chicago's historic neighborhoods. I've linked to that in the show notes along with Unwatchy's most recent cookbook, My America, recipes from a young black chef and a full transcript. Check out chicagohumanities.org for more info, along with our spring calendar, where we've still got tickets available to some amazing events, including Costume Designing Black History with Ruth E. Carter, who costume designed such iconic films as Black Panther and Do the Right Thing. And you can join the waitlist for Stacey Abrams with Jake Tapper. This conversation was recorded on one of our hub days in spring of 2022, where you can explore a full day of curated events, see your favorite speaker, and maybe learn something surprising. We'll have our fall announcement coming up soon, so stay tuned. In the meantime, give it up for Kwame Anwachi. Man, good to be here. Thank y'all for coming out. Thank you, Chef Kwame. Absolutely. Oh, Thank man. you all so much for being here. This man is like the Michael Jordan of like the cooking world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, also in addition, uh, one of uh, Food and Wine's best new chefs you were you were mentioned as uh, Esquire's uh, 2019 Chef of the Year, uh, Zagat and Forbes 30 Under 30, uh, Times 100 Next list. What else we got here? Um, let's see, Food and Wine Executive Producer. Man, this brother just doing it all out here, man. That was a really important one. Uh, his cookbook. Oh yeah. Oh the the, the cook and the cookbook. <laughs> and man, this is uh this is a pleasure to be talking to you and have you here in Chicago. Um and, and starting off with us here. Pleasure's all mine. I love Chicago. You know, as soon as I get off the plane, get a burger from Old Cheval, you know, normally get a mm-hmm. hot dog <laughs> somewhere. I gotta say I put ketchup on mine. I know oh. that's like blasphemous out here, but well ladies and gentlemen, it's been good. Thank you so much. Though, right? <laughs> <laughs> At least I was honest. I didn't have to yeah, admit yeah. that. <laughs> um, actually, my first, after hearing that list, the first thing I thought was, do you always win at that game of icebreaker where it's like, what is one interesting fact about you? And also, what is the interesting fact that you always pick? You know what I always say? I always say, um, what's his name? Mike Tyson's my uncle. Is that true, though? <laughs> no, it's oh. not true. <laughs> but it's hilarious. Boy, you, you sold it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, sold yeah. it. <laughs> I was like, I could kind of see it right here. And I, <laughs> see it in the forehead. Yeah, yeah I can see it right there. <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to jump into the book, but man, check this out. Like, this is, I want to know uh, how you feel about hearing this. Time Magazine called this one of the most anticipated cookbooks of 2022. And I, I found out, I saw uh, on your Instagram that it's already one of the, the number one bestseller on Amazon before it even came out. How does that feel? It's, um, it's, it's super surreal. You know, it's something that I, I definitely worked really, really hard for. Um, I did things different. And a lot of people were always like, why did you write a memoir at 24 years old? You know, why don't you write your cookbook first? And, you know, for me, I, I just didn't want to do what everybody else is doing. I think it's fun to, like, do things that are different. So in writing this book, even calling it My America, you know, people are thinking it's going to be like pot roast and apple pie. And it's, like, <laughs> not that at all because my version of America, you know, looks different from other people's versions of America uh, growing up. When you're a kid, you're just a kid. Yeah. You know, you're not, like, thinking of th- whatever your parents are feeding you is a certain national type of cuisine. Right. But I know that I was in America, so I just thought all Americans ate like this, Um, but it wasn't true. And that's why I put this cookbook out to show you, you know, give you a glimpse into my life and give a voice to the inaudible. There you go. For sure. You talk about the book being very different, and and, and it is very different. So it's, I almost feel like 
to call it like a cookbook is almost not doing it enough justice. Um, you, you know, how did it feel to create something that is very personal to you uh, and it really explains, you know, how you see your culinary art and, and where it came from? Because you gave a lot of derivatives of where food came from in this book. And uh, I just want to know what you think about that. This cookbook is about like the people that came before me. All these recipes are dishes that I grew up eating. So it was relatively easy for me to list out. It was probably harder for me to like omit recipes than it was to think of them for this book. Cause I was like, okay, what did my mom cook, you know, this day? What did she cook that day? What did my father's aunt cook? You know, like I just thought about what everything my family cooked on all four sides of my family. And I wanted to like really tell the story of those dishes and show why they've stood the test of time. A lot of these dishes are just selfless. You know, there wasn't, there, there's no, when you go to a Jamaican museum, the creator of curry goat, <laughs> like <laughs> that's not there. You know, the creator of oxtails. It's just like, it, it, it's, it's born from, from true stories and, and um, some of them are sad, you know, and, and some of them are beautiful. Um, and that's what I wanted to portray in this book. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, what are the four parts of your family where you've pulled these recipes from? Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Jamaica. Uh, West Africa and the American South, like Louisiana and, and others. But um, but there's there's also influence for me growing up in the Bronx and just eating like Dominican and Puerto Rican food, or being in D.C. and eating Ethiopian cuisine. So it's influence of of all the different uh, cultures that have impacted my life, whether I'm directly like related to it or, or not. I, th I think one of my favorite parts that while reading it was you don't shy away from talking about. The, the darker parts of the history of creating black, black America, right? And uh, I remember, I don't know if it was in an interview or if it was in this book, but I did a creepy amount of research. Um, you said, your grandfather told you that it is not a, a, your entire history, it is a portion of your history, but you've made a lot of connections between slavery and food. How did you, how did you get to that point? Why was it so important to create that connection? I, you know, the the connection is 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 something that's present. It's not it's not something that I created. It's just that like I like to think of food and and break it down, you know, for every single dish. And you know, for American cuisine, it's really tough to talk about American cuisine without talking about West African cuisine because it directly influenced it. Whether it's the ingredients that came, like rice and watermelon and bene seeds and okra and and yams, or or it's the actual dishes like jollof rice, which is you know now in America jambalaya, or you know fufu and stew is you know, chicken and dumplings, or um, you know suya is is barbecue. So like there's there's always the that. There's always something that you can trace within food and you can really like tell a story with a plate and also cross oceans. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I read in the book, it's really cool how you uh, it's again, it's it's not just the cookbook. It is. It's really stories and, and history lesson. Uh, if you if you turn every page is a lesson, it's something that you can learn and it's something that you can miss if you just skip over and go straight to the recipes. Uh, particularly one thing that I like is uh, you put some respect on collard greens, man. And uh, <laughs> there's a part in the book where you specifically talk about collard greens and the history about it. Uh, and it's not just, you know, something that all oh, black people eat, you know, and it's unhealthy is, is kind of what the stigma is. Uh, but you kind of gave the reason why collard greens is really important in our culture, mm -hmm. coming from the Great Migration, something we talk about on the podcast all the time. Uh, it really had a, a cultural impact uh, for generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like how you put it in the in the book. You want to tell us more about that? Yeah. You know, I, I think the history of it is, is is pretty spectacular and brilliant and just how much nutrients are actually in collard greens. And the thing that we like the most now is like the pot liquor which is like the, the sauce that comes from like stewing collard greens with like smoked pork product and aromatics. And, you know, back in slavery, uh, during slavery, you know, the enslaved Africans, all they had was a small piece of, of meat sometimes, but they, they were able to grow their own uh, vegetables. Um, they had their own small little plot of land and collards would grow like wildfire. So they would cook that with, uh, with the uh, small piece of pork and 
the uh, the adults would eat the greens, but the children would drink the pot liquor because it had the most nutrients. So it would it would carry them for you know a couple more hours than just eating the greens. Yeah. So like you know those are the stories that are intertwined in the book. You know like talking about jerk chicken, which is a dish of freedom. You know the the enslaved Africans escaped from the British and, and they climbed the mountain and they were trying to figure out how to eat without getting caught. So they got some wild thyme and wild allspice and wild chilies and lots of salt and killed some boars, some chickens, rubbed it down and dug a hole <laughs> and got some embers and threw it on top of that and then covered it so their smoke wouldn't allow um, you know, their location to be, to be revealed. And that's how jerk chicken came about, you know? So like those stories I think are so important. Um, you know, some of them, like I said, are, are, are pretty sad, but they're important that we know these things so we can really give them the respect that they deserve. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say real quick, uh, in that specific section, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's green, collard greens and other vegetables. Um, there's 14 different recipes specifically just surrounding like, the vegetables and the leafy type of things and the way you mix that stuff. I'm not a cook, y'all. I'm, I'm not a cook at all. So you could have put five different things. I would have been like, dang, that's crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but like, but it was it was just really amazing to see that you you took that and you stretched it. And you just said, hey, look, there's more creativity with this. So I just want to commend you on that one. That was, it was fascinating. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, my next question was going to be about, in your introduction, no specific page, uh, you talked about uh, your first restaurant shutting down and how that was kind of a hard, obviously a really hard thing when you have a project like that. But then you traveled a lot to kind of revisit the places where you, that inspired a lot of your recipes, right? Um, uh, mentally, how was that transition from going to, I guess, if, if people aren't aware, you're French trained, right? Uh, so you talk about the incorporating the French technique into cooking the recipes that felt like home that aren't necessarily present in that. How did you mentally get to a point where you are comfortable incorporating both or you are, you know, you're creative and it doesn't feel like you have to choose one or the other? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. I think I just started wanting to cook the food that I crave more than anything else. Um, and that was just food that I grew up eating. Now I cook it uh, differently because I have a different culinary lens, you know, based off of my training and my upbringing. But I just got to a point where I just wanted to cook food that that I crave. And the the way it honestly like really really came about was, you know, my first restaurant closed when I was young. I was like 23, 24. It lasted like nine weeks. It was a it was a disaster. But I started doing events and I started cooking more Caribbean style food. And then I did this event for Quest Love. Um, and this was like before Impossible Burger meat came out and they sent it to us and it was for Earth Day. And we had to like use that. And I tasted it and I was like, this is so gross. I don't know what to do with this. Um, it Agree. Was, it was bro. an early, re early rendition of it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, why don't I just make Jamaican beef patties? Like, I can put like breadcrumbs in it. I can season it really, really well. I can make a dope like calypso sauce and I'll make the, you know, the dough from scratch and everything. And I made it and it was a huge hit. And I was like, why don't I just like massage this and try to keep cooking food that, that like I'm super familiar with. And that's how I got really, really comfortable with it. That's that's pretty dope. You, along those lines, too, you were talking about there's a holy trinity of uh, Cajun and Creole foods. And I'm going to list the holy trinity to y'all. Uh, it's uh, onions, bell peppers and uh, celery. I had no clue. Uh, I've been praising the wrong guy. Uh, <laughs> like, that, now that I think about it, that is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> did you come up with that, or is that something that's no, okay? No. All right, I, look. Hey, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's been around for a long time. Okay, shoot. Um, I'm in the kitchen praising everything now. Shoot. Thank you, McCormick. Thank you, all that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Dario will eat a burger every night if he could. Well, there's a burger recipe in there. Oh, I saw it, bro. I saw it. <laughs> that was the first page I turned to. Uh, <laughs> you know what's funny? You were talking about how you uh, you cook for certain people. Uh, and there was a, there's a part in the book that is uh, really cool. is uh, talking about baby back ribs. And uh, I have <laughs> a quote, y'all, so that you have to remember it. Uh, he said, baby back ribs without mac and cheese is like Jay-Z without Beyonce. Great, of course. 
but not yet at his full form. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. Now that I think about it, I'm like, man, ribs and, and you know, like, have you ever eaten it without mac and cheese? No, you haven't. You know? no. What's, what That's kind of mac and cheese do you like? Do you like, obviously, baked? Uh, well, if you get the book, My America. <laughs> uh, hey. Mac and cheese that I love. Um, no, I like baked mac and cheese, but my mom, she she made stovetop mac and cheese growing up with like a bunch of different cheeses in it. So the recipe in the book is kind of a blend of both. Like I make a, you know, a Mornay sauce um, and then fold that into the noodles, add like five different types of cheeses and uh, bake it off. So it's like a blend. Um, Speaking my a language. Blend. <laughs> I actually, speaking of flavors, because I remember you saying that you don't like bitter flavors. And then uh, I remember your interview with Harper Bazaar where they said, what do you have in the morning? You said, I'm not a breakfast person, but you have four shots of espresso and you don't like the flavor of coffee. Do you feel like that's a red flag? <laughs> or <laughs> It's one of them. It's one of them. I have another, I, I I have another red flag for you. For you. I drink it for few. <laughs> That's this my is. my second red flag is this. This is not a question. I just need you to know that he's not a dessert person. Okay, not a dessert person. But I like ice cream. Well, uh, well I know you like Jenny's, but what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Like a generic ice cream flavor, or like the fancy shop ice it's cream. It's your show, flavors? whatever. Um, <laughs> like generic is like cookies and cream, and then like at Jenny's is uh, gooey butter cake. Oh, that's a really good one. You know what I'm saying yeah, gooey butter cake. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I never, I never had that. It's I feel because like I'm you stay in the car anytime we go to Jenny's. <laughs> now, you refuse to get out and get ice cream. It smells so sweet. For, first of all, <laughs> I, mean, I knew it was a matter of time until she started breaking into me. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, I, I, I had, uh, I had something else. You talk about uh, some history about how mac and cheese really came here and who got credit for it. So uh, let me take y'all on a little history lesson. Y'all can read the rest of the book. But James Hen Hemmings, I had no clue. Uh, he was the one that kind of found it. And thanks to you, you told me. Uh, Thomas Jefferson got a lot of credit for that. And they used to call mac and cheese uh, macaroni pie. How do you know this stuff, bro? Like, like <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of documentation on, on, on these things out there. Um, and... It's something that I like to do in my spare time. And, and I like to get to the root of all different dishes. It's just something I like to nerd out on that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, hard pivot. While you travel back for, for this research and these recipes, for me, one of the things that popped into my head was that when I moved here from Jordan a decade ago, I really struggled with being maybe a bit too pretentious about the authenticity of food, right? So I would com always compare it to food that I had back home and it, it doesn't taste the same or it's something slightly different. How do you feel about that concept of like food is not authentic? Do you feel like it maybe stifles creativity? Because you're very creative in your recipes, so. Yeah, I mean, I think authenticity, um, it varies from person to person. You know, somebody's gumbo recipe in Louisiana is going to be different depending on what house you go to. I think that there's an essence of each dish that you need to really um, keep intact. And before you go out and, like, do something super creative, I think you need to understand the essence of the dish. And, yeah, authentic authenticity, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, you know, and things have been done for a very long time and if anyone thinks that they created something first i'm pretty sure that, that it that it's been done before so i think it's um there's a fine line between like just being authentic to a recipe and then having your own creative license on it a lot of the recipes in the book i feel are are authentic but just like the cook, cooking methods and the layering of flavor is just seen through the way that i cook do you have uh, a, a certain recipe or dish that based on like, you know, trying to get it right with the ancestors and your family, do you have something that you like, man, I do not want to mess this up? <laughs> um, gumbo, for sure. Um, oxtails, curried goat, um, shrimp etouffee. Like a lot of these dishes are like, I can't Hard. mess it up at all. Yeah. Like just, just actual, just rice, just plain rice, yeah. you know? <laughs> I have a recipe in there just for perfectly steamed rice, you know? So, like, most of these dishes, if I mess up, like, I'm going to get my black card revoked. <laughs> so I need to, like, make sure that they're straight. Uh, I know you said uh, previously your mom had a catering company, so you started cooking with her, right, illegally, because you were five. Um, <laughs> just Trapped child for labor. a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, has she tried any 
any of these recipes that are in the book and do you look for her seal of approval or um she tries a lot of the recipes when she's like um because she still cooks to this day so i'll send her recipes a lot of these recipes i've had for a while like these are a lot of recipes that i've cooked in restaurants or along um you know just just the uh, just along the way of you know cooking professionally so she's tried a lot of them and yeah she she loves them she does that's, yeah, I don't have a joke about that. Yeah, <laughs> you you bet not. That's that's mom. Don't play with mom. Yeah, uh, you you have about uh, over 125 different recipes in this book. Uh, I just want to know, man, of of all 125, which one, which one? Don't you, say your most favorite. No, 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 no. Not the fa- not the favorite. Uh, but which one do you have the most fun making? You know what I mean? Just fun, not the one that you like the most. The most fun making. Mm, probably the jerk chicken. Because it takes like yeah. three days. Hey, your black card is solid, my brother. You good? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a perfect answer. <laughs> Ain't going nowhere. <laughs> um, the jerk chicken, because like I make this jerk brine, I make the you know, jerk paste from scratch, make like a gin- ginger garlic puree and like brine the chicken, then marinate it for a couple of days and then smoke it like low and slow and then make a jerk barbecue sauce. So like it's... It's something that I take a lot of pride in is the jerk chicken. Um, there's a lot of bad jerk chicken out here. Yes, it is. So yes, yes. Um, <laughs> when when you do when you do it right, it feels it feels great. Yeah. Um, speaking of the garlic puree, your first chapter is pantry, which I love that. I've I don't it again reminded me I related a lot to it because I grew up in my grandmother's pantry where she like pickled things and had house spices and stuff for the for the people that didn't necessarily have that experience why was it important for you to start with that chapter uh it's the it's the starting of layering of flavor like you you can't really get to the other recipes until you get through the pantry so you know it's making all of your hot sauces from scratch making your marinade making your spice blends um even like browning you know we used to like you know make brown stew chicken and rice and peas um all of those things are important. They also last incredibly long, you know, in the freezer or, or in an airtight container. So if you start with those things, like you can make all these dishes relatively quickly. And the pantry is so important in the Caribbean and Southern and West African um, culture because we have to preserve a lot of things. Um, and then through that act of preservation, we also found that it tastes fucking delicious. So... <laughs> So it, it's an important thing for this book. And I think it, it can also transcend into just dishes that you already cook. Who's Who's been the most fun that you've cooked for? Because I know you, you, you've cooked for the Obamas. You cook for Jay-Z and Beyonce. Who's been who's been the most fun person you cook for? My family. Aww. Okay, okay. okay Go ahead. other than that. Psych! Yeah. <laughs> um, the most fun, probably Dave Chappelle. Oh wow. oh wow! Yeah. Oh wow! What did he order? Like, what do you, <laughs> what do you want? I've cooked for him so many times. So like uh, like oxtails or like whole fried red snapper with like a brown Ooh. stew glaze. Um, I did a whole dinner based off of like his life one time. So there was like from different places he 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 grew up. So oh, wow. just a lot of different stuff. Yeah. So you, but he's easy to cook for because he just likes everything. So yeah. he's, not, he's not picky. He's just like, hot food, let's go. You have a lot of experience. I know we talked about it. You have a lot of experience in pretty much all over the world, man. Like, uh, I think that was the most amazing part is because it's like a journey through, um, you know, with your family too. You know, when you went back as an adult to uh, Lagos, you know what I mean? That was, that was fantastic here. What place... Uh, gave you probably the most inspiration? Yes. I mean, it's hard to like quantify inspiration because like you never know when it's going to like come out. I think it goes in and then it it spurts out at different times. Um, I I think they all were so great. You know, like being in Nigeria, it was, especially as a child, it was so, such a culture shock for me. Um, You know, tending the land, you know, if I wanted a 10 piece chicken wing bucket, (laughs) took five chickens and it you know, it was like five months <laughs> and to raise them, of yeah, the and murder because I named them and murder, then, yeah. yeah. Just murder. So, so yeah, there was, and but but it taught me like to respect our, our respect our ingredients, and you know, not to waste things. You know, Trinidad and Tobago was just like um, a kaleidoscope of flavors. You know, because all the different cultures there, as well as Jamaica, and the American South is like it put a like a face to the name, you know, of these dishes that I've been eating this whole time, like seeing actually where they come from. When you go home, what is a meal that you request? 
From my servant? From, from like, your, no, no, like, <laughs> like if you, no, no. And I go, no, like, like bring what? me the mac and cheese. <laughs> no, like, <laughs> my requesting. No, like, if I, if I go home, I ask my mom to make me something okay, that, okay. that um, she makes really When I go really to my well. mom's house, I always, I beg her to make gumbo. Mm. It was like a dish that she made on our birthdays or on Christmas. So if she ever, you know, is in town, I always make sure that, that, she makes that and I freeze some, you know, so I can always have a oh, taste nice. of home. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. How long, how, uh, who's better? You or mom? Who's, who's gumbo? Be honest. My mom's. Okay, sure. mom's First. gumbo still king? Okay. Is this a uh, recording? <laughs> <laughs> no, my mom. My mom is a blueprint for gumbo and she makes it with her eyes closed. Oh, wow. Like I'm there with like two pairs of glasses on <laughs> trying to figure stuff out. Like she's just like a total pro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about that, like cooking with like eyeballing things. Uh, how hard was it to write a bunch of recipes when that's really like how you cook is you eyeball? Well, no, because I you know I operate restaurants, so like when I'm at home, I eyeball. But like, I can't tell everybody to just put a little bit of this, a little of that. You know, you'll have gumbo different ways seven days seven days a week if if, if you do that. So I already had recipes pretty standardized um, before this, and then. You know, we had to test these recipes out as well, so that was another opportunity to to weigh them. What uh, What about this book? Do you that stands out the most in the creative process uh, as you were making it? What What do you remember the most about this book? It was really hard. That's what I remember because it was a pandemic. Um, I was like filming Top Chef at the time, so like I was testing recipes like after filming, or like my recipe tester would like ship me because you'd have to test them yourself and then have someone else test it. So they would ship it to me in these like styrofoam boxes overnight. And it was just, it was a lot of work, but it was like a care package from home every time I opened it up because it was like recipes that I grew up eating. So it was a beautiful process. I love that. How was the experience from going, going from being a contestant to actually being a judge on Top Chef? That must've been weird. Yeah. I, I walked in, I thought I was getting pranked and they were going to be like, okay, your time starts now. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> uh. Um... But that never happened, you know, and it, 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 it took some getting used to. But I think it came from a more empathy, a place of empathy as a judge that has actually been through that as opposed to someone who's just like, you know, a celebrity or something. You know, like I understand the time constraints. I understand the stresses. I understand like being on TV for the first time with a bunch of cameras in your face. You're not you may not put your best foot forward at all times. So I think that helped me in the judging process. But it was cool. It was really cool being behind, being on the other side of the table. I, I like that place a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, are you I mean. are you still a hard judge? <laughs> um, I think I'm just very direct, you know. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm a hard judge. Honestly, honestly, best possibly. If it don't taste good, you need more seasoning, brother. Just That's put it. it in. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I like. It. I think most of the contestants they want to hear honesty right. as well, and and I think um, constructive criticism so they can become better. And I think that's what the best chefs are that come out of that show, the ones that like really listen to the judges and then really impart that into their cooking. Oh, I want to ask you about the nail polish. Okay, so yeah, I read the, it's the cutest story. I want you to share with everyone <laughs> how you got to your nail polish. Yeah, so I came up with a nail polish line. It's uh, breathable. It's safe for the kitchen, which is, which is cool. And the colors are like based off of like kitchen items. So there's saute silver, there's eggplant, and there's chef's kiss. Um, but I usually get my nieces every summer and they beg me to go get their nails done with them. This was like four years ago, and I got all black, and I was like, "This is kind of fly," and I never stopped getting it. You know, this is this may be you know personal for me, but like I, reading your story, man, and just knowing who you are, and then looking at the book, um, do you feel like you are a role model? I'm gonna say specifically for black people, black men. That's that's you know, you know, because you're using the culinary arts to to really. Uh, showcase talent, you know, in a different way. And it feels different than, you know, you've seen other, you know, chefs go about it. Do you feel like you are a role model? Do you want to be a role model? Uh, I feel like anybody with a platform has a responsibility um, to, like, lift people up. And I would hope that people would look up to that as inspiration. I don't think that that's, like, the, the, the focal point for me. But it, but it does come with the territory of um, making sure you're inspiring people and uh, leaving the world a better place than, than you left it. And if, if we all have that mindset, then we all are role models at the end of the day. You know, we should all be just trying to like spread love 
you know, and and um, and helping out each other because we're stronger together than we are apart. Do you have any uh, words uh, for anybody that's looking to, to jump into, you know, writing a book or um, just do it? Just do whatever you want to do. This the, the like the fact that we're we can talk on cell phone to go to the moon. It shows you that we can do anything that we really put our minds to. So I would say just just do it. Just start that chapter. Just you know get that job. Just go to school. Just do whatever you want to do in life because it, it really is such a gift. And to waste it is a is a dishonor to anyone who's come before us. Um, and my last question before we open it up for uh, the audience to ask um, is if you if you were to have people have one takeaway from the book, what would it be? What would you want people to get from it? I want them to get um, to open. I want them to open their eyes to other cultures um, and understand how much of a melting pot America is. You know, your neighbor has a totally different upbringing than than you, um, but they are your neighbor, mm -hmm. and just get to know them, and it would expand like your mind a little bit and your heart. For sure. That's a that's a perfect answer right there. Yeah, that's I love it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Oliver. I'm about to graduate high school next week, um, hey. and I'm congratulations. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm planning on going to culinary school. And I was just wondering, what is the hardest part of like fully committing yourself to the craft, like stretching yourself out there and like making it like a core part of your life? You gotta want it as much as you want to breathe. Hmm. You know, you, you have to think about it at every single turn. It's got to like really be your everything, at least for a little bit. You, you know, you, you have to really dedicate yourself to it. Um, and that's that's the advice that I give any any culinary student that comes and asks, like, OK, what should I do? Find the hardest restaurant in your town and go and work there. I don't care if you like the food. I, I want you to see what it's like to work, you know, really, really hard uh, at, at a high level. And every single craft is like that. If you want to be the best eyeglass designer, you know, you go to the best and, and really put your head down. And then when you leave there, you have all the options to do what you want to do. So so just give it your all. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you talk about palate fatigue when you're uh, judging on Top Chef and mm. how unfair it might be for the, uh, you know, the eighth contestant or the 16th contestant that day? Hmm. I don't really get palate fatigue when I'm judging the this, this shows. I know other a lot of people do. Um, I think because I only take a couple bites of each dish. Um, I think when I first started, it was when it was really good. I would eat the whole thing, and it was like, <laughs> fuck, and then, you know, I couldn't even eat anything else. But I think when you when you just understand it's a marathon, not a race, um, it it does help. So the second part of the question is uh, from your gay contingency of fans. Did you know that you were? Um, baiting us by wearing all that nail polish and all the jewelry. <laughs> what is what is baiting? <laughs> <laughs> that you were sending some kind of like uh, signal about your gender expression that was confusing to us and making us hope, you know? Oh, yeah. well, keep hope alive. <laughs> I have a question and a compliment. First of all, I'm a middle school language arts teacher, seventh and eighth grade. Got your book. Oh, it's nice. great. Thank you. And it's in my classroom library. Wow. I think it's wonderful. And then are you still friends with the with the people, the pack that you catered with when you were going through culinary school, working mm -hmm. in all those years? They still, they still work with, with me, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. I love that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so it's a little stupid, uh, but I'd like to know where you get your groceries. That's a great question. This sounds like a sponsorship answer. <laughs> I get my groceries from Whole Foods. Um, Whole Foods, farmers markets, um, yeah, probably those two things. Uh, in LA, what's the? There's a store called Ralph's, um, Kroger. So it depends on what city I'm in, but you know, definitely I'll, I'll go to Whole Foods or like a farmers market for groceries. Why didn't I think of that question? That's yeah, no I one's had, ever asked me that. It's I great. have the same question about spices because one of my friends that used to run a Mexican restaurant would actually go to Mexico to get the spices. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder where you get your spices. I get them like when I'm working in restaurants. 
they'll be from certain purveyors. So they they have like purveyors that specialize in getting certain spices, you know, like Chef's Warehouse and Baldor. So that's normally where I get my spices. But like if someone's going somewhere, I'll tell them definitely bring me something back because there's certain stuff you can't get here, like from Nigeria or Ethiopia. Um, and then if I'm in like Trinidad, I'll bring back, you know, curry powder. If I'm in Jamaica, I'll bring back certain type of spice. So on the travels, but like I can't bring a bulk amount of that. So um, I get them from different purveyors. Hi, thank you so much for, for being here today. In my role in my professional career, I'm an advisor for students going into a variety of different fields. Um, and one of the things I talk about with students is the role of mentorship um, and how that changes over the course of your career. Would you be willing to share a little bit about how you were mentored early on and maybe how that mentorship has changed as you progressed in your professional career? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really have many mentors like that. My mom was my mentor. You know, she had the catering company. She was someone that I went to for advice very, very often. And then I had mentors along the way that kind of like looked out for me. But that that like professional mentor that other people have had, I've, I've never had that. It was my mom, honestly. But, um, you know, I think it, it's really important to when you do have a platform to mentor somebody to like really try to find someone that, you know, you want to push along or someone that you truly believe in. I have um, the Kwame and Wachi Scholarship Fund where I put a student through the Culinary Institute of America um, on a full ride um, and then mentor them throughout the way. So they have my phone number, you know, we have like monthly meetings. Whenever I'm in their city, they'll come and hang out and do events. Um, so yeah. So obviously cooking can be an emotional process. So thinking about your cookbook and how you created it, was there a particular recipe that was an emotional process in the creation and development of it? Yeah, I would say it's, it's a very simple one, but rice and eggs. Um, it's like a Southern dish. It's, it's very cheap to make, you know, and it's like the day after you make something with rice, you're like, you know, use the leftover rice and saute with eggs and maybe some, a little bit of garlic and Creole spice. And that's a whole meal. And I just really enjoyed it as a kid, and I didn't. I didn't think I would. As, I would enjoy it as much as an adult, and it just brought back so many memories of like being with my family through struggles, but still like eating good at the end of the day. Can you share your, I guess, feelings about everything that restaurants have gone through in the wake of COVID? Yeah, I think it's been really tough for a multitude of reasons. Um, for chefs having to like push through and like squeeze every single penny out of anything that they could um, to, to make sure that their staff was working the whole time. I thought that was like super admirable. Um, and then what, you know, restaurant workers just kind of being, not kind of, but being first responders at the end of the day too. You know, people had to eat and restaurants had to stay open. So I, I think it was incredibly tough, but there's also like a reckoning of the restaurant industry of saying like they don't really want to work in restaurants anymore because- yeah it's incredibly tough and they don't get paid a lot. So I think on all sides, it was like for, for chefs and restaurateurs, it was like, how do we make this a viable business? How do we pay our staff properly? And how do we make money? Um, so I think honestly, people are still figuring it out, you know, um, and it's going to take some time to really figure it out. But I think this industry is a very fickle industry. You know, we need we need rebates on, on, on taxes alone because it is uh, such a, um, an integral part of the fabric of America, you know, like restaurants, yeah. like you, you, you can't, you can't have any event without food. Right. You know, there's going to be food in the back, by the way, um, after this, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's not, it's not <laughs> but you know, you, you, you know, you, when you, when you're mourning, there's food, you know, when you're celebrating, there's food, when you're going to meet someone, there's normally food. It's so important. And there needs to be some, some rebate or something because you know the cost of an onion hasn't really gone up in the past 10 years but the cost of rent has yeah. and um that that really needs to be addressed okay final question um could you name like the top maybe two or three people that you admire the most in what they're doing currently in the food industry and why top two or three people i admire the most in the food industry um Probably Jose Andres for, you know, for what he's doing. Um, you know, there's the Independent Restaurant Coalition, you know, that was, 
then there's a plethora of chefs that are involved in that. Um, but like, you know, Tom Colicchio and Andrew Zimmerman are, are definitely like the leaders of it, I would say. Um, so like, I would, I would put all of them in there. Yep. There, there you go, man. Chef. Thank you so much for, for you. being here, man. Uh, we appreciate everything you're doing, man, and much success to you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming out. Get a book for yourself. Get it for your family. Get it for your friends. I think it's a really important book to have um, as an American. So thank you. That was Kwame Anwachi with Dario Durham and Sarah Fada recorded live at the University of Illinois Chicago in spring 2022. Make sure to check out the show notes for links to lots of fun stuff, including Anwachi's jerk chicken recipe, which looks like that's what I'm doing for the next two days. We'll be back in two weeks with another great episode for you. Chicago Humanities Tapes is produced and hosted by me, Elisa Rosenthal, with tons of support from the wonderful folks at Chicago Humanities who are booking these speakers and making them sound fantastic. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe, available wherever you stream your podcasts and direct from our website. Thanks for listening. And as always, stay human.